I, I think it's important that we start our journey just as Ignatius, in a way, starts the spiritual exercises with a consideration of what he calls the principle and foundation. So this is what Ignatius says. God, who loves us, creates us, and wants to share his life with us forever. Our love response takes shape in our praise, honor, and service of this God of our life. And all the things in this world are also created because of God's love. They become a context of gifts presented to us so that we can know God more easily and make a return of love more readily. So it's all about a conversation of love and enabling that conversation and focusing it on who our God is. As a result, Ignatius says, we should show reverence for all of the gifts of creation and collaborate, labor with the Lord, collaborate with God in using them so that by being good stewards, we can develop as loving persons in our care of the world and its development. But, Ignatius says, but if we abuse any of these gifts of creation, or on the contrary, if we take them as the center of our lives rather than God, putting someone else in God's place as the center of our lives. Then we break our relationship with God and we hinder our growth as loving persons. In everyday life then, we must hold ourselves in balance before all created gifts insofar as we have a choice and are not bound by some <coughs> responsibility. This is a powerful assertion. And it starts with a powerful assertion of who our God is. And it really is inviting us to a way of living that really could be very contrary to what we experience in our everyday lives, in our contemporary culture. So it's a, it's a matter of the heart, really, rather than it is of the head. In my life, what is my principle, and what are my foundations, what are my beliefs, and what are the ones that might, be, might need to be tweaked or honed a little bit because they're getting in the way of finding that peace that God wants to instill deep into our heart. God, who loves us, creates us, and wants to share his life with us forever. And our love response takes shape in our praise, honor, and service of this God of our life. God, who loves us, the first four words. God, who loves us. I think right away we're, we're being presented with an understanding of who our God is that, in a way, might still come as a surprise to us. So we've heard over and over again, God loves us. But I think it's important we understand exactly what that's claiming and what that is claiming is untrue in our understanding or, or our distorted images sometimes of who our God is. See, this God who loves us is not a distant or a dispassionate or a judging God. It's rather a God who from the very first acts of creation is moved by a love that wants to share all of who God is and all of that joy and that serenity in his heart that, as Father Rollheiser said, was buried deep in our hearts. He wants to share that with us. And why? Simply because he loves us. And as would be the hallmark of any genuine love relationship, he wants to share. He wants to share all of that grace and all of that joy, all of that serenity with each and every one of us. I think we have to admit that that knowledge always needs to be deepened and widened to embrace every aspect of who we are. You know, it's simple enough, isn't it, at times, to give God praise and glory when everything is going great. We're working on all cylinders and everything is in place and all of my hopes and expectations are being met. But when failures and worries and fears and disappointments come our way, as we know, they always will because we don't live in a straight line life. We have ups and downs and we have times when we're in consolation and times when we're in what Ignatius calls desolation. In those darker moments, they're the times when we might find that our vision of God is a little bit clouded or compromised. We might, for example, when things are just not going right and we just have doubts and confusions and disappointments and sadness in our heart, that we feel, well, well God is distant from our struggles and our fears. God, we have this voice in our heads of saying, God really doesn't have the time nor the interest in being involved in your trivial meanderings. He just has more important things to do. God doesn't really care about these trivial, in, in one sense, struggles or fears or doubts that I have in my heart. Or maybe even worse, we hear this voice telling us that God's disappointed with me. And that's why these bad things are happening to me, because God's disappointed. I, I haven't made good choices recently in the past, so God is kind of, kind of you know, pulling out uh, the, the stronger instruments of discouragement to kind of you know, straighten me out, you know, shape me up. Or maybe God is disappointed in my, my lack of faith at times. Well, we'll come back to those voices in a moment, but I think before anything else, we have to recognize whose voice that is. That is not 
the voice of God. They are really temptations from an evil spirit who is desperate at distorting our understanding of this God who loves us. And I think purifying that realization of who our God is and nurturing uh, in our hearts, that's going to be a never-ending challenge for us. We're never going to stop needing to grow in, in, in wiping away those fears and those, those misunderstandings and those, those judgmental or distant or, or angry images we have of God holding a thunderbolt in his hand. If we want to put it in a, in a single declarative sentence, what Ignatius is telling us is this, that God's love for us is unconditional. God's love for us is unconditional. And I think that's the truth that needs to be reclaimed every single moment of every day of our lives. God's love for us is unconditional. That, I think, is the fundamental grace that we need to ask God to let ourselves be convicted about in our hearts, that God's love for me is unconditional. And I'll do the best I can, and I know I'm going to fall, but it's not going to reduce or diminish or, or compromise the love that God has for me. He will always invite me to come forward and come into his grace. Who is the God of your imagination? Well, that's what we're here, right? We're trying to dismantle maybe a few bad images we have of who God is. Who is this God of your imagination? Because I think there's some images there that kind of strike to the heart that what sometimes the devil wants me to put as the focus for my understanding of who God is, and it's going to get in the way of God's love for me. Well, you might say, well, of course, not, not silly. That's not my image of God. But, but if you're anything like me, there are vestiges of that image, especially when things are going wrong. It's, oh, God's angry with me again. God's kind of waving these bad mistakes that I've made in the past in front of me and punishing me because of them. That's not God talking. It's God, the niggling customs officer who's rifling through your moral suitcase, looking for your good deeds and mostly your bad ones. He's going to wave them in your face. The omnipotent thug who invades you to rob you of peace and joy. Do you, wanna, do you want to know what your Heavenly Father is like? Look into the eyes of Jesus. Remember when Jesus turns to Andrew and Philip who are following him and says, what are you looking for? Come and see. Look into the eyes of Jesus. Be the person that he's asking that question to and taking his, his invitation to heart. Come and see. That's the encounter. Look into the eyes of Jesus. Anyway, that, that's the first focus for this principle and foundation. It's, it's all about you know, God's unconditional love for us. But then comes the second half. The second half of the principle and foundation is what is our response? What is our response going to be to God's unconditional love for us? And here, I think, is where we need to be very, very careful because this, considering our response to God's invitations in our lives, that's going to mean that we look carefully and guardedly at who we are. And there are some subtle pitfalls that we have to be very careful about as we travel along that kind of a road of self-discovery. Because there's a lot about who we are and how we have been reared that we need to let be open to growth, just like we needed to be open to how our images of God need to be open to growth. Our images of who we are maybe need to be open to growth. So let's again, let's take a look at what Ignatius proposes that we consider when we talk about our response. He says, all the things in this world are also created because of God's love. They become a context of gifts presented to us so that we can know God more easily, make a return of love more readily. And as a result, he says, as a result, we show reverence for all of the gifts of creation and we collaborate with God so that by being good stewards, by being good stewards, we develop uh, in our um, as loving persons in our care of God's world, by being good stewards. See, here's where the challenge is. Here's where those images of who I am get in the way. This challenge to be a good steward, you know, it kind of reminds me of those parables that Jesus uh, talks about in the Gospels about the good and faithful steward. They can bring up a number of worries and anxieties and fears for me that I really need at least to take a look at in my life. And I just want to share three of them with you because you might have your own worries and fears and anxieties. What this, what this call to stewardship is going to mean to me? What's it going to cost me? Am I up to that kind of a call? It might be because I'm interpreting it very poorly, you know, and I'm interpreting who I am to receive it very poorly. For me, the first worry or anxiety that this call to stewardship it, it uh, awakens in me is this. What exactly, what exactly are the expectations of my management of these gifts, of my being a steward? What are the duties that I 
have being presented to me. I spent a lot of my time as a Jesuit teaching computer science, actually mathematics and then computer science at various universities throughout several provinces. So I'm, I'm very used to definite rules and carefully crafted algorithms. So, so I guess what I'm saying here is that, well, if you're going to call me to be a steward, where's the instruction manual? Where's the instruction manual? What exactly do I have to do? Because I have this drive for perfection. If I'm going to do something, I've got to do it right, and I've got to do it completely, and I've got to do that right the first time so that I don't mess it up. You know, and, and I, I don't think I'm alone in having that drive to perfection. I mean, I think all of us have that. And it's a wonderful grace from God, an invitation to respond fully and completely and to be aligned to his victory over all the powers of darkness in our world. But it can become exaggerated. That drive to perfection can become the God rather than God inviting me to just do the best you can. I got this, God's telling me. Just do the best you can. But now sometimes that drive to perfection for me is the voice of the devil, of an evil spirit who wants to discourage me. You know, in the 12-step program, they frequently talk about expectations, you know, things that we expect to be the case. And they have this wonderful, you know, saying, like anything, it's not 100% true, but it's this, expectations are resentments waiting to happen. You know, because we have this, if it doesn't happen this way, then it's bad, it's wrong. If, I, if my understanding of the stewardship is, is not completed, then, then I, I'm a failure, I'm a, I'm a loser. It's not God talking right there. You know, that's the devil discouraging me. Yeah. So anyway, that's my first concern. What exactly are the expectations of my management of these gifts? Second concern is this. What exactly is included in the list of gifts that God has given to me? How can I identify what's included and what's not? And more importantly, are there priorities of entries? Does my response to this invitation to stewardship depend on this invitation to stewardship, and that depends on this one. In other words, this is this nerd computer science mind trying to build a decision tree. And here are all the nodes of this call to stewardship. And at each node, there's a good choice and a bad choice. And if I make the bad choice, well, then the traversal of the tree is over for me. I, I can't go back up the tree, so it's all done. Again, it, it's a drive for manageability and control, which, are, again, is, is a wonderful desire, but it can get exaggerated. It's leaving no room for God to say, wait, wait, I want you to do this instead of that. They both look good to you right now, but this is the way I, I'd like you to go. These are some of the warning flags that this call to stewardship evokes in my heart. And that, they always wind up giving me some fears and worries and anxieties. And the important thing is this. Before I go any further in trying to answer those kinds of questions, I need to understand where are they coming from? Where are those kinds of anxieties coming from? You know, in the spiritual exercises, I'm sure you probably already know this, but Ignatius spends a lot of time in what he calls the rules for the discerning the movement of the spirits in our lives, discerning how God is inviting me and how sometimes the enemy of my human nature is inviting me. He has actually 14 rules for the discernment of spirits that he includes for people in the beginning part of the spiritual exercises, in week one of the spiritual exercises, which is kind of where we are at this moment in our journey this weekend. He has 14 rules for discerning what's going on, how, how are the spirits inviting me. And here's rule number two. This is very helpful for me. Rule number two of those first 14 rules. He says this, for those who are progressing from good to better in their spiritual life, I think that's us, right? Because we wouldn't come to Montserrat if we were not progressing from good to better. We'd have found something, quote, better to do than to, to offer these three days to the Lord. For those who are progressing from good to better in their spiritual life, it is the way of the evil spirit to sow disquiet, anxiety, and fear. Wow, there it is. That's exactly what I'm experiencing in my three concerns. Disquiet, anxiety, and fear. I think what Ignatius is proposing in this second rule is critical. At least it's very critical for me. And that's this, that this call to stewardship, this call to live a life of fidelity and grace to God's invitations, it is not my call. It is God's call. And he's going to give each and every one of us the gifts of his spirit to, to lead us and guide us in our response, to be able to give him praise, reverence, and service. You know, the, the serenity prayer, the wisdom to make the right choices. God's going to give me that wisdom to make the right choices. But, but there is this darker spirit who is desperate to keep me from embracing that kind of a truth, who will stop at nothing to keep me in darkness and in self-contempt. You've got to be aware We've got to have the humility and the courage to look into our hearts and say, yeah, I am fearful, I am angry, I am disappointed, or I am joyful, I am hopeful, I am thankful. 
Look at what's going on in our hearts. Be aware. Don't say, oh, no, that's not manly to be worried about emotions. Let me just get to the, the, the facts and get it. Now, be aware of what's going on in your heart. And then secondly, identifying those movements. Are they coming from God? And then finally, making a choice. Based on that awareness and that identification, if it's coming from God, I will choose to pursue it, to enhance it, to follow it, to, to, to nourish it. Or if they're coming from an evil spirit, I'm going to choose to change the channel. This is not God talking right now. So aware, identify, and choose. For me, I, said, I, I think in a way those, those concerns, those anxieties and fears occurred for me because I was not aware that my focus was skewed from the very beginning. Remember the first sentence of the principle and foundation? God who loves us, creates us, wants to share his life with us forever. The center of that truth is really in how much God loves me and not, not in how much I need to prove my worthiness to my God. And all those fears of failing to live up to the, the calls to stewardship in my life, they're all based on a refusal to let go of the controls. In some kind of a perverse way, I'm viewing all of those invitations as a test that God is subjecting me to. And it's up to me, and it's up to me alone, to get that passing grade. I think, at least for me, that way lies darkness and despair, because that way is leading me away from God, or at least away from this God that Ignatius is picturing for me. So, briefly, back to the three questions I had. What are my duties as a steward? But first of all, and above all, to let God's invitations and God's gifts be received for what they are. They are gifts to me, ways in which God is communicating to me his love and inviting me to celebrate along with him his ongoing creation, <laughs> his ongoing creation of everything that he has so lovingly created. And here's the point. If I make mistakes, if I make mistakes along the way, then he simply smiles and says, it's okay, I've got this. So, don't be afraid. Just do the best that you can. God loves us as we are, not as we think we should be, because we're never going to be what we think we should be. What, what freedom there is in that? God loves us as we are, not as we think we should be. There's those expectations that can lead to resentments, because we're never going to be what we think we should be. We've got to give room to God to continue to open us up to the, the truth of God's grace for us. You know, you get, if it's an important decision, especially, you've got to pray about it. You've got to give it a lot of time. You don't make a hasty decision. You maybe even need to talk to some other people whose, whose wisdom you, you uh, value and, and you appreciate, and maybe a spiritual director. And, uh, you know, give it a, a journaling, as Father Derek was saying, and you know, to see, well, you know, has, how's this going over the course of days and months and maybe even years? Eventually, you've got to make a choice. You can't be sitting there forever thinking about it. You've got to make a choice. And here's where it got interesting for me. Bishop Barron says that, so if you make a choice and it happens not to be the one that God was hoping you would make, because remember, we have free will, right? So we can make whatever choice we come up with. If it happens not to be the one that God was hoping we'd make, this is what Bishop Barron says, well, then God shuffles the deck. God shuffles the deck. It gives me another choice that leads me closer to where he knows I'm going to find peace and grace and fulfillment. God will continue to shuffle the deck. It's an ongoing conversation that God has with my life. So for me, you know, that decision tree that I was talking about, here are the nodes, and if I make a wrong choice at any node, I'm done, can't, it's all over. No, that, that's not a good image. That's not a good image for how God and that conversation of discerning God's will is all about. It's much better image would be Google Maps, you know, and you put in your destination in Google Maps, and you say, say so Google Maps, okay, turn left here, turn right here. Well, if at one point uh, Google says turn right and you miss it, you keep going straight, what happens? Well, Google Maps doesn't say, okay, fine, pull over to the side of the road and get out and walk, you idiot, because you're <laughs> not talking. No, Google said, no, it's okay, go up here, take another left, or I'll get you back, I'll reroute you. That's what God does. That's what this conversation of discernment. The, the second question I have, what, what exactly are the list of gifts that are included? Well, the short answer is absolutely everything is a gift from my God. And not just those things I can call to mind easily, like family and friends and successes and personal accomplishments and happy memories, bright stories in my life. Well, sure, there, there are ways in which God has gifted himself to me. But also those that come in darker wrappings, like sicknesses, and failures, and fears, and losses and struggles in relationships, those clouded stories that are part of my life that probably have much more tragic conclusions. Well, granted, in those kind of moments, it would be much more difficult to give God thanks in those kinds of darker times of, times of, of disappointment and confusion and sadness in my heart. 
But see, they're precisely the times when God's grace is all that more powerful in my heart. When I come, as Paul says, when I come face to face with my powerlessness, then as Paul says, when I am weak, then I am strong, because it's then that the power of Christ dwells in me. It's at those moments when the power of Christ is awakened in me. And that's the lesson that I learned over and over again in the times I was in charge of that infirmary, the Jesuit infirmary in St. Louis, that when I am weak, those men were telling me, when I am weak, then I am strong, because now it's the power of Christ that is dwelling within me. So how do I recognize those gifts? Well, first of all, I've got to put down that clouded mirror of self-doubt and surrender to God's promise of his loving presence in my life. And that's the challenge that's with us every day, every day of our lives. And the closer that we can come to an attitude of readiness and of a determination to let God be God, the more distant will become questions like, what are the priorities involved? Because I'm now face to face with the giver in the gifts. And I have a conversation with God that's going to lead me to make the best choice I can and the fact that God will never abandon me in that journey. And that last concern I have, how do I measure my success? Well, obviously, the short answer there is I don't, because it's God. It is God whose plan of salvation is beyond my comprehension, a plan whose victory really has already been assured in, it, in the gift of his own son's life and death and resurrection. Here's an example of that that frequently comes up sometimes in those gifted conversations I have with people who come to Montserrat. This will be the problem. Father, I don't know what to do about my children or my grandchildren. They're not practicing their faith, and I'm really worried and concerned about this. And this is a genuine concern out of love, right, for our children or our grandchildren. And it's, it's, a, it's a desire to, to let them be as close to God as we know will give them grace and serenity and peace in their hearts. But there's a prior question, I think, that it brings up, and that is, what are my duties? What are my duties as a loving parent or grandparent. First of all, just like God for me, to show my children my unconditional love for them, or my grandchildren, my unconditional love for them. To accept them where they are, and to trust that they will continue to be led by God into grace and into life. To trust that I am not here to save them. That's God's job. The path that God has in mind for them. And it may not be the one that I think should be the case, right? I love this image of a, of a grandmother doing a needlepoint, you know, in a circular piece of cloth, and she's sewing this beautiful image on the cloth. Well, if you're the grandchild sitting on our lap and you're looking up, it looks like crap, right? This little strings hanging down here. That, that's nothing. This is no good. But not on, not on your grandmother's side. It's a beautiful picture being created. That's God's beautiful picture. We can trust in that. And we just do the best we can to make sure that our faith is part of the magnet that God can use to, to anchor those threads for my children or my grandchildren. To do the best I can and surrender the rest to God. If I can live my life with that kind of a openness and humility, then really success is already guaranteed. And it's a success that cannot be measured in degrees. There is a better way to live our lives with that kind of a surrender to God and his plan and his grace in our hearts. And that's what Ignatius says in the very conclusion of the principle and foundation in everyday life, then, I'm going to hold myself in balance, in balance, sometimes that's translated as in the indifference, in balance before, uh, before all created gifts, insofar as I have a choice. Not fixing my desires on health or sickness, wealth, poverty, success, failure, long life or short, for everything has potential of calling forth a more loving response to my life forever with God. Everything has that potential within it. And this is the line. Our only desire and our one choice should be this. I want and I choose what better leads to God's deepening life in me. There it is. There's the desire. If we hold that desire up in the front, what better leads to God's deepening life in me? And I think, you know, we're all going to be all the greater for that grace.